Good evening. Uh, I want to thank the SPIE for the invitation and the opportunity to speak with you tonight and thank all of you for being here. I really enjoyed the, the previous four uh, speakers. Um, for the next 20 minutes, I'd like to take you a, a few astronomical units away from San Diego to the surface of Mars uh, and talk to you a bit about the role of autonomy in enabling our exploration of the red planet. So why do we need autonomy? A lot of robots we can just teleoperate. Um, well, one of the most obvious reasons is distance and, and the latency or round trip light time that that implies. Uh, even for a robot at the moon, you could teleoperate it, you could joystick it because the round trip light time is only a couple of seconds. Uh, but when you start looking at the distance between Earth and Mars over a synodic period of 26 months, which is sort of the relative uh, orbital uh, motion of the two planets, those distances vary from uh, 60 million kilometers up to 400 million kilometers. And the round trip light time can vary up to 45 minutes. So clearly you can't joystick anything on the surface of Mars with those kinds of latencies involved. So our vehicles at Mars need to have the capabilities, the autonomy to take care of themselves over those kinds of time scales uh, in order to be productive and to be safe. What else drives the need for autonomy? Well, first of all, in situ exploration on the surface of Mars, you have a spacecraft working in an unpredictable environment. Uh, on the left here, you see uh, uh, two views of Mars, one uh, during clear skies, another during a global dust storm. And these dust storms occur throughout the Martian year uh, during particular seasons. They can be local, they can be global. Uh, and one of the important effects that they have is to drastically reduce the amount of sunlight reaching the surface. So for any kind of a solar-powered rover, for instance, uh, that rover needs to be able to react to the presence of a dust storm, to be able to deal with the fact that its energy budget just changed by a factor of uh, four or more, uh, and be able to hunker down and take care of itself through many sols of activity on the surface until that dust storm clears. Uh, so that's an example of unpredictability. Another example on the right, you may have read about the, uh, uh, the wheels on the Curiosity rover having suffered a lot of damage. And that's because we encountered terrain there that we had never seen before. We came upon an area where there were very sharp, small, jagged pebbles kind of cemented into the ground. Uh, and as we drove over them, we started to observe uh, significant damage to the titanium wheels on the rover. And so we're developing autonomy capabilities now to be able to recognize and characterize different terrain uh, classes that we're driving over and be able to avoid those types of dangerous terrains. The bottom line, though, is that uh, exploration on the surface of Mars is a contact sport. Uh, and so when we're drilling into the, into the surface of Mars, drilling into bedrock, uh, we have to be e expecting and planning for and capable of responding to unexpected events. Anybody who spent some time with a drill just doing some work around the house knows that uh, funny things can happen with that drill bit. Uh, and so we have to be able to autonomously operate that drill uh, without help from, uh, from Earth on time scales of, of many tens of minutes or hours. So let's uh, take a snapshot at the Curiosity rover. This is our sort of state-of-the-art autonomy capability at Mars today. Uh, it launched in 2011, arrived in 2012. Uh, it's about a metric ton in size, 900 kilograms, uh, and it's a very capable, uh, very capable robotic explorer. You can think of it as sort of a robotic geochemist, whereas the earlier Spirit and Opportunity were, were robotic geologists. Uh, this mission goes a step further and samples the planet and carries uh, analytical instruments on board that allow it to assess the habitability, the, the geochemistry of the site at which it landed. It has a number of cameras that it carries, uh, you can see here uh, the mast camera. This is a very high resolution camera with uh, angular resolution a bit better than the human eye, multispectral. It can also uh, acquire short, high definition videos. We also have a camera on the end of the arm, similar to what a geologist would carry out into the field to look up close at a rock that it wants to uh, examine and decide if it wants to do further analysis on it. Um, we have a number of spectrometers that allow us to identify the elemental composition of rocks from a distance. Um, we also have these analytical instruments I measured, uh, I mentioned earlier, that allow us to really do uh, analysis of the, the soil samples and rock samples that we acquire there on the surface. In fact, the sample analysis at Mars uh, in instrument is, in effect, a wet chemistry lab that we've carried to Mars that lets us do chemistry analysis on these samples. Okay, uh, 
This is the place we sent the Curiosity rover. It's called Gale Crater. It's very interesting. It's about 150 kilometers wide. Uh, and it appears this was a, a crater formed by impact uh, between three and four billion years ago. And it appears over time that uh, water flowed in this uh, crater and that sedimentary deposits were laid down over time. Uh, what you see in the center here is called Mount, Ch Mount Sharp. Uh, it's almost as high as the crater rim. It's, a it's actually higher than the, the, the one side of the crater rim. Uh, and over time, it's been eroded, uh, leaving this record of sedimentary deposits. And so as we, we land next to this Mount Sharp, uh, and the mission of Curiosity is to climb up the flanks of Mount Sharp and essentially be walking through time as it climbs these sedimentary layers deposits. So how did we get to that spot? Uh, you've probably heard about the seven minutes of terror. Uh, during those seven minutes, the vehicle was on its own. Uh, when, it, when we got word back here on Earth that it had just reached the top of the atmosphere, uh, that was 14 minutes uh, after that had happened. So by the time we heard that it was at the top of the atmosphere, it was already on the surface, and it was either alive and safe or a splat on the surface. We didn't know. We had to wait and find out. So the vehicle had to get itself down. What did it do to do that? Uh, it separated from its cruise stage just before reaching Mars. Uh, it used a heat shield to initially slow down. The vehicle actually has lift, uh, and it can control that lift by roll steering the spacecraft. And so we used that in what we call guided entry to actually target the landing site that we wanted to get to. So we had a relatively sm much smaller error ellipse than prior Mars missions. At Mach 2, we popped a parachute um, and then uh, dropped the heat shield and started collecting radar data with a very sophisticated KA band multi-beam radar. So six separate beams that are acquiring altimetry and velocimetry information relative to the surface. Uh, and based on that information, at a certain point, we drop out of the back shell on a descent stage, which flies down to the surface, again, using that radar to sense uh, the altimetry and velocimetry as we descend. When we get close to the surface, we'll go up to this inset here, we basically hovered. We call this a sky crane function, and we lowered that rover on a tether down to the surface. Uh, the advantage of this approach, it looks kind of crazy, but the great advantage is the rover is deposited on the surface, wheels in the, in the dirt, ready to roll. Uh, at that point, the descent stage uh, severs the, uh, the tether and flies away and crashes. So now that we're on the surface, what does a day in the life of the rover look like? Uh, what I'm showing here is uh, uh, one full saw, morning, noon, evening, whoops, let's go backwards evening and midnight. Um, so every Martian morning, the rover basically wakes up, things start warming up, it gets warm enough for its actuators to be able to be operated. And around 9 or 10 in the morning, we send some commands from Earth, uh, from our deep space network. And those commands are basically high-level goals for the day, for the SOL. A SOL is a Martian day, about 24 hours and 40 minutes. Um, and so, from that point on, for the rest of the day, the rover's on its own to try to achieve those objectives. Uh, and it works during the sunlit portion of the day uh, and gets, tries to get those objectives achieved. Uh, in the middle of the afternoon, around 3 to 4 p.m., a couple of our science orbiters in sun-synchronous orbits will typically fly over. And in addition to doing their own science, they're equipped to relay data from the rover. So the bulk of the data that we get back from the rovers comes via these relay flights, re relay over flights that occur several times each sol. And so this data that comes back in the Martian afternoon is immediately relayed back to Earth to our Earth science and engineering teams. And the science and engineering teams basically have to work the Martian graveyard shift. So while the, uh, the rover is resting and sleeping overnight, the teams on Earth are frantically assessing that data set, trying to figure out what happened. Did the, did the rover achieve its goals? Did it drive to a new place? Do we have images of what this new place looks like? Did we run into some anomalies that we need to address uh, in the next SOL? And during that Martian night, they generate the plan to be sent up the next SOL in the morning. So that's the SOL by SOL cycle, day in the life of the rover. OK, here's some examples of uh, some of the autonomy that's key to operating on the surface. Uh, navigating on the surface, we don't have GPS. Our navigation is primarily vision-based. And what you're seeing here is a nav camera view. And uh, I'll also show you a uh, HASCAM view. These are stereo cameras on board the rover that we use to form digital elevation maps in the vicinity of, of the rover. 
And you can see that digital elevation map being generated on board the rover and then supporting safe driving activities uh, each saw. Um, we step forward here a little bit. This is actually the first autonomous drive that we did on Mars. It's about 10 meters. And you can see we take very short steps, about 30 to 50 centimeters stop. Uh, the mast camera up here acquires some uh, nav cam images uh, with stereoscopic vision, and we uh, plan our route as we go. Uh, you can see that in this case, the route chose to avoid some of these small obstacles along the way. Uh, and so this auto navigation is very important in terms of enabling the autonomous drive capability on the surface. The other kind of vision processing we do is something we call visual odometry. Here is where we take pictures both before and after a short drive to tell us, based on the imaging, how far we moved. What's the change in position and attitude of the rover? You can see examples of that here. And the reason that's important is we have odometry on the wheels that tells us how far the wheels have turned. But if we're in an environment where we're, there's slippage, um, then this visual odometry will tell us uh, exactly how far we really moved, and it'll also most importantly tell us those wheels are spinning and digging yourself into the sand. Uh, you probably know that we lost the Spirit rover because of just that kind of a scenario where uh, it didn't have this capability and it embedded itself uh, in, in some unexpectedly loose uh, regolith. So this visual odometry is very important for keeping the rover safe. Okay, let me just show you a couple of snapshots of some of the challenging places we've been with this rover. Uh, this is the buckskin drill site. You can actually see the drill hole that was acquired by the drill. This is a, basically a selfie that, uh, ch that Curiosity took with that camera on the end of its arm. Uh, and, and so this is a mosaic of about 50 or 60 different images stitched together to form this, uh, um, this, this selfie. But you can see just how rugged this terrain is. We're, really, uh, we're not driving on highways here. This is really some off-road terrain. Here's another interesting place. Uh, we went through a gap uh, across some dune fields uh, in a gap between two geologic formations. Uh, this was about a year ago. And uh, you can again see the, 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 the wheel tracks of the rover as it passes through this uh, dingo gap. Uh, and finally, here's a place called Murray Buttes. You can again see some very rugged terrain uh, in this region and some outcrops. Uh, and the, the mobility and the autonomy capabilities of this rover are really key to enabling it to explore these classes of terrain. When we started out on the surface, almost all of the science targeting was done by the scientists on the ground. What that means, though, if you remember that Saul in the life picture, is that uh, everything had to wait a day. So we would drive, take some pictures, and scientists overnight would figure out what was worth looking at the next Saul. But well, we wanted to speed things up. So we've developed software called Aegis, Autonomous Exploration for Gathering Increased Science, that lets us pick science targets at the end of a drive autonomously without scientists directly in the loop. And here's an example of that. Uh, so the ChemCam instrument is a very interesting instrument on Curiosity. It's basically a laser that zaps rocks from five or 10 meters away and then uses a spectrometer to look at the emission from that spot on the rock and be able to identify the elemental composition of that rock. What we've done is uh, develop software that uses the cameras on board the mast to select the most scientifically interesting targets for ChemCam to interrogate. Uh, now, we're not taking the scientists out of the loop. The rules that are built into that software come from the science team. So they, they generate rules to identify what, what types of rocks, what type of rock targets will be most interesting to look at with ChemCam. Uh, and this is an example uh, using the, the, the criteria that they've selected. This rock was selected as the highest priority target. A number of secondary priority targets are also identified in blue. And this has greatly increased the productivity of the rover to have this kind of aut autonomous science targeting capability on board. Okay, what about our next rover, Looking Beyond Curiosity? We plan to launch a very similar rover in terms of its general shape and size in 2020. Uh, and it's, uh, uh, of course, called the Mars 2020 rover. I'm sure at some point in time we'll, we'll have a naming contest and it'll get a new name. But right now it's called the Mars 2020 rover. Uh, it looks very similar in shape, but it has an entirely new science instrument suite. Here's another uh, uh, physical view of the rover. Um, and its mission, as opposed to analyzing samples in situ at Mars, is to use its instruments to pick out the most interesting rock targets and then drill rock cores of those samples, put the, and the, each, each rock core sample is about the size of your finger, 
and it'll then cache those sample tubes on the surface of Mars for potential return to Earth uh, assisted by future missions, and I'll, I'll walk you through that scenario in a moment. But this is a very ambitious mission, um, and so when it lands in 2021, uh, in a Martian year, it will have to carry out the acquisition of about three dozen of these sample, uh, uh, sample cores uh, at several different scientifically interesting regions of interest within the landing site that is ultimately selected. And that's gonna really push the autonomy capabilities of the vehicle to be productive on that time scale. One of the really uh, cool features that Mars 2020 will have on board is something we call terrain relative navigation. So all of our landers to date have basically landed blind. Uh, they, we, we navigate them as well as we can to the top of the atmosphere, uh, but then they just land somewhere in that error ellipse, 10, to 20, 10 by 20 kilometer error ellipse, uh, and wherever they land, we hope it's uh, not on top of a rock, we hope it's safe, uh, but they're pretty much on their own. And that has forced us to date to pick relatively benign landing sites in terms of the number of rock hazards or slope hazards that might be encountered. So on Mars 2020, for the first time, we'll have a lander vision system on board. So while we're on the parachute, we'll be looking down, taking uh, images of the surface that we're approaching. And on board, we'll have pre-stored maps from our high-resolution orbiter uh, remote sensing uh, cameras, uh, pre-stored maps of the landing site. So we'll know immediately exactly where we are in that landing ellipse. And uh, we'll be able to take measures to, to divert the, the final landing trajectory to a safe spot. So for instance, if this was our landing ellipse and the red regions indicate uh, dangerous hazardous spots, with just a relatively modest amount of horizontal divert capability, we can change that map into something that's completely safe um, so that no matter where we're headed, with a small divert, we can find a safe spot to land on the surface of Mars. Now what's really important, if you think about it, is the most scientifically interesting places to go, particularly for this sampling mission, our places are, are gonna have a lot of exposed bedrock uh, outcrops. And so those are places that are gonna have natural hazards. They're gonna look like this. So T, this TRN, Terrain Relative Navigation, is turning out to be critical in terms of allowing this mission to go to the really interesting science targets on Mars. Okay, I said that uh, we're gonna wanna bring those sample tubes back. This is what that architecture would look like. We don't yet have a commitment for these follow-on missions, but we have a concept. Uh, Mars 2020 will, will acquire those sample tubes and put them on the surface. Uh, we would send a, a, a subsequent landed mission called Mars Sample Return Lander. It would have both a fetch rover and a Mars ascent vehicle. The fetch rover would, would go out and collect those tubes from the surface and bring them back to the Mars ascent vehicle. Mars ascent vehicle would put those into Martian orbit. And then a third mission, the Mars Sample Return Orbiter, would have the job of rendezvousing with that uh, sample canister about this big holding 20 to 36 uh, sample tubes inside of it, uh, capture it, contain it safely, bring it back to Earth, put it in an Earth entry vehicle that lands probably in the Utah desert where we would take it to a biocontainment facility and basically unleash all the uh, analytical capabilities of terrestrial laboratories to really understand what uh, secrets those samples might hold. So that's a hopefully a very exciting series of missions that can play out over the coming decade. Um, we're also looking at other types of mission concepts. Um, something that's been of great scientific interest recently is the notion of what are called recurring slope lineae. These are dark streaks that have been observed on the sides of crater walls on a seasonal basis. And one hypothesis is that they are brine flows that are triggered by seasonal warming. Uh, and if that's the case, there's certainly interest in any, any place on Earth where we see liquid water, we see life. Uh, and so could these be uh, habitats for extant life today? Um, but how do we get to those kind of places? Uh, and so we, we've developed a, uh, uh, a repelling rover, we call it Axel, uh, and basically it uses a tether to repel down the side of a cliff face or a crater wall and carries instruments inside its wheels that it can use to make measurements of the Martian surface. Um, you can imagine in terms of autonomy that this has some particularly challenging aspects uh, in terms of managing this tether, in terms of navigating uh, on this rocky uh, high slope uh, area. We're able to go down slopes of uh, 60, 70, 80 degrees with this kind of a capability. 
Um, and so this, uh, I think, will be enabling in terms of allowing us to uh, access extreme terrain that previously we've never been able to go to. Okay, and just to wrap it up, uh, here's even a more audacious concept. This is a Mars helicopter. And again, we're trying to think of ways that we can get to uh, parts of, of Mars that perhaps conventional rovers can't get to. Uh, this is a technology development. We'd like to see this fly uh, in the near term on one of our future rovers. Oops, I knew I would do that. There we go. Um, you might think it's easy to fly on Mars because the gravity's less, but it's actually really hard to fly on Mars because there's very little air there. Uh, the atmosphere on Mars is about 1% the density of the atmosphere uh, on Earth. What that means is you, meet, you need much larger rotors, you need much higher rotor speed in order to generate the lift uh, to get this guy off the ground. Uh, this, this is a two kilogram, under two kilogram helicopter with a 1.2 meter uh, diameter rotor. Uh, the rotor has to spin at 0.7 the speed of sound on Mars, so Mach 0.7 to generate enough lift. Um, and uh, it's got a little solar panel on the top that you can see there on that little disc. Uh, and it takes a couple of sols on the surface to charge up the battery. And then we can do, uh, based on that charge, a flight of um, about 100 seconds or about 150 meters. Uh, so that's a, sort of a, a new way of exploring the surface of Mars that we're just starting to explore. Okay, and so let me wrap it up here um, and let's go back to Curiosity. Uh, yesterday was a very special day for Curiosity. It, it was the fifth anniversary of Curiosity's landing in Gale Crater. So I'm assuming that today uh, Curiosity kind of took it easy. It probably uh, had a little celebration last night. Um, and, uh, but, but it's been a very productive mission and we're looking forward to uh, another five years, hopefully, of, uh, of active exploration of this Gale Crater and marching up the sides of Mount Sharp to really understand the history of, uh, of that particular region on Mars. Thank you very much.